Hi, welcome to Cross Point Community Church. I'm Brandon. And I'm Nathaniel, and here's what you need to know this week. One of the things unique about Cross Point is our teamwork. We strive to do things well as a team at Cross Point. Therefore, we have small groups. This is where a group of people get together and they basically grow in their relationship with God. If you're wondering what those boxes were when you walked in, back there, that's Tom. It stands for Ties, Offerings, and Missions. And this is how we take offering here at Cross Point. The Bible says we'll find strength and encouragement by telling stories about how God has impacted our lives. So we'd like to hear some of your stories about how God or how the church has impacted your life. Simply send your story to email crosspoint at gmail.com. We use these stories to see how the church is developing everybody in the congregation. And we like to show these stories to all of our volunteers to show them what kind of a difference they're making. If you have any extra time, be sure to stop by our blog at crosspointcommunity.wordpress.com. Here you can check out the new sermon series and any new books that we think are interesting. And uh, it'll give you the whole rundown on both of them and basically just post your ideas about them. And you can also check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash crosspointonline. There you can check out any new blog postings or just check out what's new. In two weeks, we kick off our new series, Ghost Stories. It'll be a spooky series that you will not want to miss. Well, next week we're going to have kid stuff, and the theme for that week is going to be unique. So, for that, we want you to carve or paint your own pumpkin, and the winners are going to get prizes. Don't want to miss that. Students, tonight is student takeover starting at 6 o'clock. Come out at 5.30 for some pizza, games, hangout time, and we will be wrapping up our series, My World versus The World. Today we continue on with our series, Photoshop My Life, with part three, the story before the story. Well, that's all we got on the need to know this week. Don't forget to drop your offering and time on the way out. And if you have any questions, stop by the welcome table. Or you can visit our website, crosspointonline.net. Or you can check out our app. Yes, yes, I am. There should be eight minutes on this. <laughs> I really meant 
and into the world of Pixar and Disney. Um, we have not tried action movies yet. Um, we'll wait until her mom is away on the weekends, and then we will give that a shot. I think, I think girls like Terminator, right? <laughs> it's educating. Um, I, I realize we've probably been doing a little too much um, because the other day Maddie was in her room and she's on the floor. She keeps looking under the bed. <laughs> uh, we have watched Monsters, Inc. an enormous amount of times. The other one is, I believe, if we watch Finding Nemo one more time, I'm calling Guinness because of the record company, not the beer, although both would apply. <laughs> Uh, the book is titled Story, and the kind of subtitle to it is Substance, Structure, Style, and the Principles of Screenwriting. So this other book kept writing them like, this is kind of the, every movie that you've watched, just about every screenwriter has read this book. And so I was just curious, I was like, ah, oh, I wonder what on earth is in there. And so it's been really interesting to me, as I've been reading this book, is because as we've had these movies on, I've really seen some of the principles come out in the movies. One of the things that this book talk, talks a lot about is the three-act structure of books. How many of you have heard of the three-act structure? Good. Not just a few. Great. Because this makes me feel better because this is like new information to you. And it makes me feel smarter because you don't know that in our series Photoshop my life on comparing yourself to others. So thank you for not doing that. So uh, this book, uh, one of the interesting parts is the three-act structure. And this works for plays, this works for movies, this works for novels. And they say just about everything that you see in the past 50 years follows the three-act structure. Now, the three-act structure is this. Act one is setup, act two is confrontation, and act three is resolution. Same story, but it's got three basic movements and then a whole bunch of scenes that fall within those movements. So it's set up, introduce you to the characters, introduce you to the conflict, and then normally there is this significant scene that dives you into act two, where most of the conflict goes on and the majority of the story is, which always builds up to the act three climax. And it's really interesting because it's got just about a whole chapter in this book talking about the act three climax, and how if it's not for the act three climax, your story is worth nothing. It doesn't matter. It's not worth telling. Because people love the Act 3 Climax. Act 3 Climax, um, how many of you saw the new Batman movie? Shame. Or either you're not participating, or you should just be ashamed of yourself. Because it was amazing. Um, the Act 3 Climax, it, I can see it best in the Batman movie, is because like, it's the moment in action movies when the hero and the villain like walk through the battle untouched, even though the armies are fighting, to the other villain. And it's like everybody completely ignores the main character. And they say, like, it's so in Batman, it's like Batman and Bane. And they walk through like, an entire battlefield. And for some reason, everybody ignores the guy in the black helmet and this. Well, let's just, we just must be passing by. And so he goes through, and no one cares. And it's just interesting, because the whole thing is about the Act 3 climax. And so I've seen these come out in a lot of movies. That it's set up, confrontation, everything. It's all about the Act 3 climax, and then the movie resolves itself. I want to show this to you in a few different movies. And I'll give it to you in long ones and then two other short movies. Um, I want to start with Final Nemo. If we could knock these out so people can see it. Okay, I am. Go back to the two for that. There, thank you. I would not normally do Final Nemo, but I know this movie inside and out. So that is why we're going through this now, because I need to go refresh it first. So Finding Nemo, Act 1, goes like this. Um, we're introduced to Nemo and his dad, Marlin. There are some catastrophic things that have happened in their family's past. Um, Marlin is a super overprotective parent. He's scared to death that anything's going to happen to Nemo. Nemo goes to school on that uh, raid thingy, and they go on a field trip to the drop-off. That's why he drops off. That's why I assume they call it the drop-off. They go to the drop-off, which is scary, and they're not supposed to be at the drop-off, and Nemo swims up, and he touches the butt, and then he swims back down. It's really a boat, if you haven't seen it. It's really a boat. And he swims back down, and, um, and while he's swimming back, the scuba guy comes in, and he thinks he's saving Nemo, but he actually puts Nemo in the bag and takes him away to the dentist's office. Um, just a spoiler alert, in case if you haven't seen it, they find Nemo. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to prove that for anyone, but I want to make sure everyone like <laughs> So that is Act 1. Act 1 ends when Nemo is gone and his dad Marlin needs to find Nemo, which 
launches us into Act 2. Act 2 largely takes place, a good significant of it is Nemo is in the tank with other fish in the dentist's office, and it has been said that Nemo is going to be given to the dentist's niece, Darla, and you don't want to go to Darla because Darla shakes the bag and the fish always go belly up. And so they're hatching this plot as to how they can get Nemo out of the tank. So that happens on this side. The majority of the story is about Marla. Marla makes a friend Dory who has short-term memory loss. They eat sharks. They escape from sharks. Sharks say the fish are friends, not food. They meet a scary fish with a light on the end of it. I don't know what that is. School of fish make fun of them. They go through the jellies. They meet turtles. They're eaten by a whale. Go through the blowhole. And then birds on the them. Got it? Okay, good. Glad you got it. So this is the majority of action. So Nemo's in the tank. And it's the story of Marlin going through all these different things, encountering these obstacles so he can get to his son. Eventually, he gets to the point in time, Darla comes in, there's this crazy catastrophic scene. Marlin thinks that Nemo's died or something like that. And so he swims off. Nemo's okay. He meets Dory, which launches us into Act 3. Again, Dory, Bluefish, top left, short term memory loss. So, Act 3 goes like this. They're at the fishing hole. Um, there's a fishing net that goes through. Nemo or Marlin sees that his son Nemo's alive, but Dory gets caught in the fishing net, and there's this huge scene. So Marlin is this like super overprotective parent, really clingy, and Nemo goes, "We've got to save Dory." And Marlin goes, "No, no, we can't. You can't go." And he brings him back. And goes, Dad, I can do this. And Marlin goes, "Go ahead, son." And so Nemo gets in the thing. He goes, "Swim down, swim down, swim down." And the net breaks, and Marlon thinks Steve was dead, but he's okay, and they go back to the home, and they win. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Alright, here's the last time. That's good. Thank you. So I want to show you, so that's the story. I want to show you how it plays out on the title. So Act 1 goes from 0 to about 4 minutes and 30 seconds when Nemo is lost. Then the movie goes to that whole story of Nemo in the tank, Marlon going through all the different things. It goes to a minute and 18 seconds when Darla comes in, and then the movie finally wraps up at the end at a minute and 33 seconds, okay? So this is what I want you to pay careful attention to, because I'm going to show you this in two more movies. I want you to... <laughs>
sorry, um, this is what he says in the book. Surely I can bring up my next. Without Act 1 and 2, a character is not who he needs to be to succeed in Act 3. But the main character in Act 1 is very, very different from the same main character at the end of the movie. If I give you Finding Nemo as an example, Marlin is this super overprotective parent. He doesn't want his son to do anything. Yet in Act 3, we see him willingly let his son swim into a fishing net to try to save their friend. And so he is a different person from Act 1 to Act 3. That if you don't go through Act 1 and Act 2, then you're not the kind of person who can succeed in Act 3. That the character changes and the character develops over time so that they're a different person when they face the Act 3 climax, the thing of the entire story that is about. Now, this is what was so interesting to me as I've read this book and as we've watched countless movies, is our lives follow a very similar time. If I give it to you like this, just a blank one up here, we have times of setup, times of confrontation, and times of resolution. Now, this is not necessarily your whole life in this timeline. Um, I think it happens in big ways throughout our lives. Um, there are times of dependence as a kid, independence, married, children, emptiness. I, I just described your whole life right there, so that's exciting. Um, so we go through that in the bigger times of our life. Um, there are also smaller times, smaller seasons, seasons of stretching, seasons of growing, seasons of relaxation, seasons of chaos, seasons of preparation, seasons of performance. And so this may happen a few different times in your life, but this will also happen many different times along the way. That there are times of setup, introduce to the conflict, see what's going on, you go through the time of confrontation, and then there's resolution at the end. This is why I want to bring this up today. It's because the entire movie leads up to the Act 3 climax. The entire book or play leads up to the Act 3 climax, and it's about characters' progress along the way. And yet, for some reason, we live our lives as if every moment is the Act 3 climax. We go throughout our day tense and stressed as if one thing goes wrong, it's going to completely mess up the entire story. And it's like we just go through different things. Like, we act as if, if the person in front of us at the red light does not go immediately when the light turns green, then our whole day is ruined, and nothing will ever be right, and our kids are going to become druggies, and we're going to lose our house if this person does not go immediately when the light turns green. And we live with this stress that, like, if one thing goes out of balance, then nothing in my life will be right. Um, I love my favorite thing in the world, and I only get to go there occasionally, is I love going to Disney World and watching parents who live this way. And if you go to Disney World and you watch, uh, I don't mean to offend us, but the dads are the worst. The dads are the worst. Like, and they're there in the happiest place on earth, and they're miserable. You know what I'm talking about if you've been to Disney World. And this is the best one. If so, I will, I will help you with your strategy for this. Because I promise you, this is far more fun than the amusement park, or seeing Mickey and Minnie, or all those other things. You need to go, and it needs to rain in the morning. So the dad has gotten all wet, and he's dried out, and he's feeling very humid. And then when it is a hot afternoon, so if you get up there to like 90, 95, and you watch this, I mean, it's the most entertaining that you'll possibly have. Because they're in the happiest place on earth, and they're just, they're not, they're so mad at everything. And they're like, they're just one inch away from just murdering their children. <laughs> their children, they spend a lot of money to bring to the happiest place on earth. They want to kill them. And you can see this all over their faces. And normally what will happen is, like, there's been a fight. And you can always tell the couples that had a fight in Disney World because the mom will be walking way ahead with the kid, and the dad will be walking way back. And you can just see the map and everything. Like, the people come through on the bike and they're singing. <laughs> and um, the last time we went to Disney World, it was a couple years ago, um, I thought I was going to have to intervene. Um, I didn't want to intervene because I just wanted to stop and observe and laugh. But I thought I was going to have to intervene. Um, there was a dad, a whole family that walked into one of the stores. Now, like, it's a Disney store. Everything's awesome. And it's exciting. And you want to, like, grab everything and play it. I want to do that because it looks so cool. And so this family comes in, and this five-year-old boy runs in, and he grabs a little Nemo doll. This is shortly after Finding Nemo came out, and he grabs a little Nemo doll. 
And the crab walk, the dad walks over and he grabs his arm, like right here, and he yanks him back. Like, I'm amazed that the arm stayed on the kid's body. I just thought he was going to come up with a bloody stump. But he grabs his arm and he pulls him over. Don't you want to touch anything? Right? This is how parents yell. We don't actually yell, but we keep the same level of voice, but we do it with as much anger in our tone as we possibly can. Would you not touch anything? <laughs> we grab the doll and put it back in. So like I come up behind her. Home 
with the sheep. His dad wanted him to work with the sheep while all his uh, brothers are away at war. And his dad finally comes to him and he gives him some food and he goes, I want you to take this to your brothers as a gift. And so he goes to the battle lines with his brothers. And when he gets to the battle lines with the gift, he sees that the Israelite army here and the Philistine army is here. These were natural enemies. God's people are here and the Philistine army is just across the field. And while they're kind of drawn up in their battle lines, Goliath steps out. Now, this is the description that we get of Goliath. Goliath was nine feet tall. Goliath had armor that weighed 125 pounds. And this is the part that blows me away. It says the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. That's, that's just crazy to me of everything. The tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. And it says that he stepped out from the battle lines and said, we don't, basically, we don't all need to die. You sing your champion, and I'll fight them, and whoever wins will win. Now, an interesting note right here is because when he made that proclamation it said that all the Israelites were just scared to death. They kind of did one of those things that, that you do when you're asked to pray, where you go, if I don't look at them, maybe you won't call on me. You do that, right? Who wants to pray? <laughs> it's visual for some of us. But he kind of comes up and he goes, who will fight me? And says they all just kind of bow their heads and kind of cower with fear. But the interesting thing to me about it is that the person who should have fought Goliath was actually the king, King Saul. Because when we're first introduced to Saul, the Bible says that Saul was a head taller than every other man in Israel. And so it made natural sense that he would be the opponent. He would be the guy who fights the giant. But it said that Saul is well cowered in fear. And so David comes to the battle lines, and Goliath gives this proclamation, hey, who wants to fight? Whoever wins, wins. And it's that everybody just kind of cowered their heads. And it's that David goes, well, why don't we fight him? I'll fight him. I'm not scared. And so that everybody around him, idiot, you little boy, you don't even know what you're talking about. But David really did shut up about it. And he goes, why are we scared? I mean, we're God's army. I'll fight him. I've got no problem. And word eventually makes its way back to Saul, the king, who was scared, the guy who should fight Goliath. And it says, hey, the shepherd says he'll fight him. And he goes, bring him before me. And this is their interchange. This is 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. It says, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. Listen to that description. It's awesome. He says, you are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. He goes, you're just a kid. And even when he was a kid, he was a man. But he had stubble coming out of the womb. Like that's what he's telling you. But the important note is, is that in order for David to fight Goliath, Saul has to give him permission. And Saul looks at David, and he goes, no way. Now what does Saul do right there? He does the same thing that we do every time. He ignores Act 1 and Act 2 of David's life. He only sees the present moment and assumes that this is all there is, and this is all that matters. Now David has this repeat several times throughout his life, that Acts 1 and 2 lead up to a significant moment. But Saul looks at David right here, and he goes, no way. No way. And so David tells him, well, you don't know the rest of the story. And then he shares this with Saul. Verse 34. It says, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And I want you to pause right there. Because that is not the great first line. I want to fight this giant. You can't fight this giant. Well, I've been watching sheep. Okay. But then he says the rest of it. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. This is Saul said to David, Go, 
and the Lord gave it. David gives him, you don't know I have one too. And so he shares that with him. And Saul goes, okay. Now, that's the part of the story that we ignore. We know, we know the rest, right? I, I don't want to read you the rest because it's the exciting part. Um, this is uh, starting, I'm not going to have the words on the screen until verse 51, but I'm starting in verse 40. It says, Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Important note. David has no sword. But he says, Today I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give you the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. And this is verse 51. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head. Now, this is the part of the story that we love. This is the part of the story that we get pumped up about, we get excited about, and David triumphs, and David takes the Philistine's own sword and uses it to kill him and cut off his head. And this is the story. What I just read is the part that we usually tell. We love verse 51. Verse 51 is what makes this story great. But I want to tell you, verse 51 never happens. We don't get verse 51 in the Bible if verse 34 never happened. This is 34. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. We want the big moments. We want the Act 3 climax. We want verse 51. David cut off his head. But we never want to go through verse 34. We never want to live in that moment of David was keeping his father's sheep. It's saying like this. If you're going to thrive in the big story, that's the big story. David defeating the Philistine, David defeating the giants. You have to be willing to go through the story before the story. Because that's where the real life of David's at. And he says, exciting. He goes, I don't keep you my father's sheep. And he says, a lion and a bear came. But think about how many weeks or months passed where nothing actually occurred. Okay? It would be clear. His job was counting sheep. It's what we do to fall asleep. Think of how many times David sat there and went, I wonder why I'm doing this. I wonder why this matters. Is this all God has for me? Is this all there is? Aren't these the questions that we ask? Does life get any more exciting? Does life get better? Surely, I'm here for something more significant. And here's what I believe. I don't believe David ever asked those questions. Because if you look at his life, he lived in that moment fully engaged, fully invested in what he was doing. And he has this sense of destiny about him. He has this sense that he knew God was going to use him for great things. Now, there's a big difference between this. There's a big difference between a sense of destiny and just a daydream. He's not someone who sat around and just went, well, I could be doing this. This would be better. It was, I'm going to live now, and I know God is taking me 
somewhere. What I want you to hear today is that God never wastes time with the sheep. God never wastes time with the sheep. David was there for a reason. God had him going through that for a reason. There was a purpose behind it, and God never wastes that time. And I want you to hear that because we waste time with the sheep. We go through seasons of our life, and we go through different times, and instead of actually engaging in life, instead of actually investing ourselves, we just wait for it to pass by. And we spend our whole time thinking about, well, I could be doing this, though so and so is involved with this. Is this all God has for me? Because it's not that great. And instead of thriving in Act 1 and 2, instead of going through the change that is necessary for Act 1 and 2, we ignore it. So you've got to understand this. David didn't spend time with the sheep. There is no story of David and Goliath. If David slapped off and did nothing, we don't have the story of him as a giant killer because it was that time that prepared him for that. And the issue behind this, like we saw in movies, is that a character has to go through Act 1 and 2. They have to go through Act 1 and 2 to thrive in Act 3, to experience that Act 3 climax, to succeed. The issue is who you're becoming along the way. And so often we get stuck on this idea, and we think it's about what we're doing, or what we're accomplishing, or the actual work that we're engaged in. And I want to tell you this. God doesn't care that much about it. Now, I believe He does care, but He is far more concerned with the type of person you're becoming, with the type of character that you're developing, and how you're becoming a person. And the fact is that we get so focused on the do part, and He goes, no, no I'm worried about who you are. Oh. And I guess at the point in time, you think if Goliath knew David's backstory, he would have acted differently. I certainly like him. He only looked at what was in the present moment as well. But we look at that with the story before the story, and we go, of course, David. If he defeated a lion and a bear, of course he was able to slay the giants. We want verse 51, but we don't want to go through verse 34. But verse 34. Act 1 and 2 is what enables you to succeed in verse 50. So here's my question. What act are you in? Or what season are you in in your life? Because we want to make everything the big moment. We want to make everything the exciting, important part. And you know what? Sometimes you're in the season of preparation. I believe we go through two main seasons in our life. I believe we go through seasons of preparation and seasons of performance. Now, I believe these are constantly happening. I believe in some ways you constantly have to perform at some level and you're constantly being prepared. But sometimes in your life we'll much more focus on one than the other. Sometimes in your life we'll much be focused on this is how I need to grow to get to this next level or to handle this next event. And other times we're going to be in that moment. And our tendency is to only show up when we're in seasons of performance. And when we're in seasons of preparation, we slack off and we don't think it matters. Uh, I want to share two examples from my life. And uh, I'm not saying this because I do this perfectly, because I think I make fun of myself enough on Sunday mornings. Uh, but this is one thing that I have done well in my life. Um, I've had two really huge seasons of preparation. Um, the first one was the first job I had. Uh, when I was 16, I started working in a golf course, and um, it was an interesting job. Um, I didn't have a car at that point in time, and so work started at 6.30 a.m. We worked until 4.30 p.m. We worked six days a week. Um, I didn't have a car, and so I'd often have to wait for my sister to come pick me up, which meant I got to hang out with all the Guatemalans until they got deported because they didn't have their green cards, which will be a story for another day. Um, but the, one of the more interesting parts of my work at the golf course is from 6.30 to noon, we had one of three jobs. We either mowed tee boxes, we mowed greens, or we mowed bumper banks. And basically, you would get a golf cart, you put your mower in the golf cart, and you go off, and you come back when it was time for lunch, and you'd be by yourself. And this was before iPods, this was before iPhones, I didn't have enough money for a Walkman. And so, basically, I was there with myself in silence. Um, I believe I really had three options. Um, I could sing to myself, which would get me fired, um, not because they had a policy against singing, but I believe they would have a policy against me singing. 
loudly on the golf course. Um, I could just sit in silence, or my third option was I could pray. And so I spent, for two years of my life, 6.30 to noon, six days a week, praying. And I prayed about everything in the world, because that is a lot of time. Like, I prayed for all my family, and I prayed for all my friends, and I prayed for myself, and I prayed for what we were going to have for dinner. And I like, finally got the end, I was out of stuff to pray, and like, Jesus, just world peace. I don't know. I got nothing left on the list. I'm, I'm lost. But I, I did that. And you know what? I, I kind of did it. I, I didn't necessarily do it as a known discipline in my life. I kind of did it to pass the time. But I can't tell you how important that time has been to me now. Because when I go to God in prayer, I know who I'm talking to. And there is a relationship there that wouldn't have been there if I would have spent those hours in silence. Another huge time of my life for preparation was uh, the first year that I was a youth pastor. Um, the first year that I was a youth pastor, this is not true of all youth pastors, so I'm not saying this about you, Andrew. Um, I did not have much work to do. Andrew has lots of work to do. Trust me, I work with him. But I did not have much work to do. I had very little that was going on. Basically, they expected me to play dodgeball and go to concerts and not let anyone die, which many people got hurt, but no one died. So I'm happy about that. But I was expected to keep office hours. And there wasn't really anything for me to do in the office hours. And so um, I found out at our church, we had a professional development budget. It was $1,000, and it was supposed to be shared with our three staff members. And I quickly found out that the other two staff members never ever used it. So I spent $1,000 a year on books, which was awesome. And I spent all my time in my office reading, because I thought it would be looked down upon if I spent that time watching Fighting Me. <laughs> but instead I said, hey, you know what? I've got time, and I've got resources right here, and I'm going to take advantage of this. And I'll, let me be really honest with you. When I started that, I was not a reader. I, I was I a was movie watcher, but I did not think that was interesting. But through that time, it developed in me just a hunger for what God was saying and how he was acting and different people's perspectives on it that sticks with me and he has guided me to this day. Now, I could have sat around and goofed off on the internet, but I chose not to. In those two seasons, because I said, you know what? This is not a time for me to just blow off. This is not a time for me to just pass by. I'm going to make sure that I am fully invested in these seasons of preparation have led us as a church in many ways to where we are today. So I'm going to ask you what season? Because we show up for the seasons of performance, but we often let the seasons of preparation just pass by and we want to get through to the next day. And I'll give you two questions that you have to ask when you're in the season of preparation. And they're really simple. What does God want me to start? And what does God want me to stop? When you're in that season of preparation, what does God want me to start? What does God want me to take up? And what does God want me to give up? I had a long list, but I believe it could be consolidated as these two things. That if you keep asking these two questions, if you keep praying these two questions, God will guide you to what you need to do. What do you need to start? Do you need to start reading something? Do you need to start praying? Do you need to develop a relationship? Do you need to develop a habit? Is there something that you need to create in your life? Some way that you need to be trained? Some way that you need to change? Something you need to develop that will carry you through to the next level? That will change how you face the next level? Is there something you need to start? I believe the more important question is what is God going to stop? And I think so often we just keep adding things to our life, adding items, that we quit cutting stuff away, and sometimes the clutter builds up. So I'm going to ask you, is there something you need to stop? Is there a habit that you need to get rid of? A habit could be anything. To go, you know what, in this season of preparation, my anger needs to go. It needs to be gone. Because if it's still here in two years, it's really going to hurt me. Is there something you need to give up? Is there maybe a relationship that you need to cut off? Now, I, I believe that this is why we've grown as a church, that we should have strong relationships with those who don't follow Christ. That's why most of us are here, because someone was our friend. But there are times in your life that you are not strong enough to 
handle that influence. And you need to know that. So I'm not saying you're a jerk. I'm not saying you're a butt. But there may be some times that you just need to cut ties with someone. Is there a relationship you need to give up? Is there sin that you need to put to death? This is what we're going to talk a lot about in two months. But there are times when we become comfortable with our sin. And it has become an annoyance. It has become aggravating instead of realizing the power that it has. Is so there sin in your life that you need to go, you know what? This has been in my life too long. I need to put this to death. We're always ready for the seasons of performance. But we usually don't live fully engaged in the seasons of preparation. And so what's the thing you need to start? What does God want you to start? And what does God want you to stop? So with all that said, I kind of want to mess the whole thing up. And here's the truth. God doesn't waste time with the sheep. If you're going to live in the big moments, you need to be invested in the story before the story. If you want to live up to that Act 3 climax, you have to be willing to go through Act 1 and 2. But here's where it gets messed up. Is you don't get an Act 3 climax. Don't. Only God does. Only Jesus does. Because it's not about you. It's not about your glory. It's not about your name. It's about Him. I want to read very carefully. Um, surely this is verse 45. I want to read you three verses. And this is what David says to Goliath. It says, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Notice what he says. And I'm going to read the last verse too. He doesn't say I'm going to strike you down and cut off your head. And the whole world will know the story of David and Goliath. He says the whole world will know that there is a God all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. We talk a lot today about stories. I'll tell you, this is the essence of a story well lived. This is what it looks like to live your life well. Is you are lived fully engaged in Act 1 and Act 2. You go through all the preparation and all the discipline and all the confrontation that you need to go through. You live fully engaged. And then when it gets to Act 3 and you're fully prepared and you're ready to go, you step back. And you go, the glory is God's. It's not. The glory is God's. It's not. And I'll tell you, I have seen this lived out over and over again. And I've seen people like thrive in great pressure, packed moments. And they'll go, it's, it's God. And I, I want to be in that very moment. I want to be like, no, no, no. I saw you. Like, I saw you discipline yourself. I saw you prepare yourself. I saw you go through all these things when no one else was. But they get to act three and they go, no, no. It's not my story. It's his. Lord is God's. Let me tell you this. That is it's far better than any Act 3 climax that you will ever face. To get to that moment in your life, and it will probably happen a number of times, the moment of performance, the moment that everything has been building up to, and to go, it's not about me. It's Him, His strength, His power. That's worth it. That's worth it. All the training, all the confrontation, all the discipline. And that's why. Let me pray. Lord, um, I want to pray right now for the person who, uh, who they're sitting there and they, they're they just thinking, God, is this all you have for me? What I'm going through, what my life has been about, is this all you have for me? God, I want to pray for the person who is bored with their existence. I want to pray for the person who daydreams about things that matter. 
then Lord, I pray that you would give them the perspective. You would give them your thoughts and that they would understand that they are there for a reason. That the seemingly insignificant and unimportant are so incredible in your eyes that you have us there for a reason. That you are preparing a moment when we can proclaim your name, when we can proclaim your glory, and we can say that it is you who led us here, and it is you who will give us success. And so, Lord, help us not to live life just for the big moments. Help us not to be focused on other people's stories, but let us live fully engaged in what you have for us right now, knowing that you make no mistakes, and that you have us there for us. Pray this in your Son, Jesus.